Good morning everybody and welcome to our webinar here today. We're talking about why you shouldn't just be focusing on the older generations because you could be missing out on vital opportunities and I'm delighted to be joined by my two esteemed colleagues here today which we'll introduce just now. So my name is Pippa Shepherd. I am the Head of Customer Engagement uh, here at Arc and Legal and I'm joined by our CEO Dave. Good morning Dave. Good morning. And by our lovely uh, Head of Customer Delivery, Jessica Furbank. Hi, Jess. Good morning. So, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, the first thing we're going to be talking about is different generations. We recently did a survey, and, and we'll share a lot of these results with you today. Um, but just to introduce the generations for you, um, if you see this slide here, we're looking at the baby boomers, the Generation X, and the millennials, and, and going through to the Gen Z um, as we come closer and closer to the younger and younger. So putting it into context, the baby boomers, these were around with the first TVs, they will remember JFK's assassination, the sexual re revolution, um, the moon landing, hippies, they will remember all of that. The Gen Xs um, were born around the first co personal computer, they will remember the Berlin Wall, the Challenger explosion, Thatcherism, Live Age, and we're probably all latchkey kids. I know as a Gen X, I was definitely a latchkey kid. And our millennial, or Gen Y as they're known, uh, were around with the first tablets, first smartphones. I remember 9-11, year 2K, social media, PlayStation. So you can kind of get into a context of the different ages. Now, interestingly, if we look at the average age of your clients, and this is from our recent survey, you will see that predominantly people within our industry are focusing on those 61 and above, so over 60 years of age. And so that's like nearly 60% are uh, focusing on those clients. So I'm going to throw to you first, Jess, if I may. Um, can you just explain what demographic you are in? So what, what generation group are you in? I'm a millennial, Gen Y. You're a millennial. And Dave? Dare we ask? Uh, do you mean what generation am I in or which generation do I want to be in? Or well, both if you like, Dave, to be honest. Well, I'm kind of in this unfortunate situation because uh, the richest generation of all time, the baby boomers, I missed that. And uh, the generation that is going to be the richest generation of all time, the millennials, I'm very definitely not that. <laughs> I am, in fact, a, a, a Gen Xer. Oh, okay. Um, brilliant. So just... You did obviously with a lot of our clients um, from a customer success perspective and you obviously go through these kind of reports on, on, on a daily basis with our clients. Do, does this bear out what you see with the clients? Definitely. So part of our engagement calls is doing an analysis of usage, but it includes looking at the age groups of um, our clients' clients and, mm -hmm. and the documents that are drafted for them. A majority will sit between 61 and probably about 90 yeah. um, and there's a massive gap in the lower age groups um, and it's something we, we discuss in these calls of how we can maybe target those age groups and, and get them in as clients. Are you seeing anybody coming back down into the millennial ages? Anybody having success in targeting them? Yeah definitely um, but it has to be quite a key focus so it's definitely those that have it in mind that it needs to be done, know that there's an open target market there that isn't tapped into as much as the others. Yeah. Um, and it's part of digitizing the process and, and reaching those clients that way. Yeah, absolutely. And Dave, were you surprised to see that a third of people are actually targeting Gen X now? I mean, um, the oldest Gen X is touching 60. Um, so they do fall into obviously that demographic there. So were you surprised at that? Well, first of all, thanks for the reminder about the 60. <laughs> uh, that's much, much appreciated. No, not um, surprised at all, really. I think uh, the predominant thinking has been in law firms that they will target uh, baby boomers and, um, and the older Gen Xs because that's who holds the wealth. Mm -hmm. And uh, who holds the wealth then when you think about post-death uh, situations and, and opportunities that arise from that. That's kind of where um, the uh, the most lucrative opportunities are, at least now. That would be the situation, and that's certainly yeah. been the case in the past. W whether that's going to continue to be the case in the future is uh, is the, the big question. 
Brilliant. Yeah. And so why do you think people aren't trying to target the millennial? I mean, if you think about the millennial, the oldest millennial, I think is something around 44 now. Um, and they are, are, are experiencing key life triggers or may even have triggered, you know, things like getting married, having babies, buying houses, gaining assets. So why do you think that people aren't targeting millennials? I think there's a variety of reasons. I think law firms um, have a set group of clients and they uh, tend to work with that group of clients uh, quite um, quite closely and do uh, more and more work for them. So it might be trust work, it might be uh, changing LDPAs or, or a whole bunch of different things. Uh, so the driver then to, to, to grow will depend on the nature of the firm. Are they growth orientated? Is it all about profitability? Um, do they see that they're getting the revenue growth that they need out of their existing client base? Or uh, are they looking to uh, grow through different strategies, through acquisition perhaps, or uh, via, via other strategies? So that's certainly one reason. I think the other reason though really is that people just haven't paid it enough attention. It's not something that's on the radar because things have worked. Uh, for for so many years, just working with the uh, baby boomers and the Gen X generation, so why would they go out to uh, to, to talk to a new generation? Yeah. At this stage, the uh, the drivers uh, for them haven't been there. The point, of course, is well, where are we at now? Because uh, you would think that there is a, a Rubicon. There's a there's a, a point at which law firms need to start thinking about what happens in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Which brings us beautifully on to the next subject that, that we're going to be talking about, which is the great wealth transfer. Now, there's some stats here that I'm going to share on the slide. So we can see that baby boomers hold 80% of the UK's private wealth, which is a phenomenal statistic, really, there. We can see that from that consumer study there from Dunstan Thomas. Now, £5.5 trillion pounds will be inherited by the baby boomers' children or grandchildren, as, as we're seeing um, that happens. And from our survey recently, only 24% of um, our clients have a relationship with, mm. with, with their clients, children, mm. etc. And, and looking at the stat from the survey, again on the right-hand side, do you feel prepared to take advantage of the opportunities the great welfare, wealth transfer will bring? And you know, nearly half of the people are saying no. Now, I know the Great Wealth Transfer is a fantastic subject you like talking about, Dave. Do you just want to explain a little bit more on how it's going to impact those different generations and why it actually matters to the audience and why we're talking about it today? Sure, yeah. Uh, you'd uh, get your stopwatch going because I can uh, get on my soapbox yep. about this, as you know, Pippa. Uh, so the Great Wealth Transfer is the uh, greatest transformational shift in money moving around the world uh, between generations. So you've got the baby boomers, uh, who are uh, the cohort obviously born after the Second World War, the most wealthy generation of all time. Uh, and they are uh, now reaching the age of 77. The average age of death for most males in first world countries is 78. The average age across all the genders is uh, 81.7 years in uh, in the UK and, and that's kind of echoed elsewhere in first world countries. So you can see that the old, oldest baby boomers are starting to reach the point of um, statistically uh, the point of death. And what that does is it triggers that amount of money that you're talking about, that 5.5 trillion. What, what does that do? Well, it actually reallocates a massive amount of money through to, uh, to different, um, different cohorts, different generations. So who will benefit? The Gen Xs and the Millennials. So the Millennials will become um, uh, the richest generation, which is kind of interesting on its own because at the moment, just because of where they are in terms of phase of life, are the most indebted generation of all time. So one would expect and hope that um, some of that money would go into debt reduction. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, you're, you're talking about wealth generally. You're not just talking about uh, pension funds and, uh, and things. You're talking about houses. You're talking about jewellery. You're talking about cars. You're talking about all sorts of different things. And uh, that will transition through to, um, to different generations. So what, what happens with that flow of money? How does that inf impact the um, estate planning industry? And kind of where, where does that leave us? Because here we are on the precipice of this massive transformational shift globally, trillions and trillions of pounds being transitioned. And yet you've got the millennials who uh, the most recent IRN research report tells us only 25% of them have an estate plan. 
well, so what? You might say, okay, you know, uh, well, the 44, they're owning businesses, they're, um, they've got kids, they've got all the trigger points for, houses, for the world. Yeah, and, dating assets, yeah, and going through divorces. <laughs> exactly, and, uh, you know, they're going to inherit all of, this, all of this wealth. So when you look at that, for estate planning practitioners, that represents a massive, massive opportunity to uh, future-proof your business as against uh, this trend that's happening, whether you like it or not, whether you're ready for it or not. Uh, and also to make sure that you have um, participated in the transfer because that transition of that wealth is, uh, is going to be really, really critical to uh, ensure that it's tax efficient. And I think all the practitioners who are, who are in the webinar today understand that. But uh, it's also really critical to make sure that the wishes of the testator and the um, uh, and the uh, people who have created that wealth are, are met and how do you do that without having a family wealth conversation? How do you do that without understanding kind of not just what the testator wants but who the beneficiaries are and um, and how you can best assist the uh, the beneficiaries? So a lot more work. Obviously one of the other things to, to consider is that the first contact that any practitioner has with the beneficiaries is typically an LPA because you start talking about care homes, you start talking about trust, you start talking about um, uh, things like dementia and, and other impacts. So uh, th that on its own is an opportunity to then create a relationship uh, with the beneficiaries and to, uh, to build a position of trust. Yeah, start that, that lifelong relationship now while the opportunity, because you know they're gonna become the wealthy clients of the future there. So as you're just talking about that, we've just got the slide here that shows how much they are going to inherit. Um, and you can see here that like more than 50%, I think it works out, or around 50% are going to be inheriting more than 300,000 pounds. So when you start talking about being the wealthiest generation, that, that kind of bears out in the statistics. And 52% here feel that their clients are concerned about how their money will actually be managed. And that comes mm. back to your point, doesn't it? That there is a real concern, isn't there? I think there's a concern, yes. Yeah. So all the research tells us that there's a concern, and, and some of the reasons for that are that um, a lot of the people who are going to be inheriting the wealth don't have uh, advisors in place, so financial mm -hmm. advisors, and they don't have yeah. a relationship with with uh, legal professionals who can guide yeah. and assist them. Um, you know, if I'm a testator and I've worked hard and I've created all this wealth, um, I, I would be concerned about that because that could mean that instead of having created generational wealth, which could last for your great grandchildren, uh, that in fact it's it's gone in a generation, and that that's you know deeply concerning. Can I come to you then, Jess? You know, as the millennial, <laughs> you know, and potentially you know somebody who may inherit. I'm not going to ask you about your personal finances, <laughs> but you know, would you feel confident if you inherited a load of money of knowing what to do with it and, and knowing the advice? Definitely not. Definitely not. And but I think you know, if, if I was in that position at this point, I feel I don't need a financial advisor. Yeah. I don't know that I'm going to be inheriting tons of money. So, yeah. well, hopefully tons of money. <laughs> um, but, you know, so it is, it's having that wider conversation yeah. with your client to, that they need to impart that knowledge to the beneficiary. So get the, them yeah. to realise that they could potentially be... And would you be welcome to a message from a solicitors, from your, you know, from who your mum and dad, for example, deal with from a solicitor's perspective, would you be welcome to start that conversation about family wealth? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, very open to it. Yeah. You know, it's quite a great responsibility to inherit a lot of money. Yeah. And you could easily go wild with it, but I can't, yeah. like they were saying, that's not how probably a parent or grandparent would want that money to be spent. Uh, absolutely, so. and, and obviously you've got children as well, Dave, so, mm. you know, would you welcome that kind of approach to getting your children involved in the wider conversation? Yeah, I would. Um, you know, obviously doing what I do um, uh, means that you're, you're much more aware of uh, these sorts of things. Um, so I uh, have these conversations with, with my kids, um, but that's not something that every family does. Mm -hmm, yeah. um, so, and, and you've got to look at why every family does or doesn't. And, and yeah. you know, death, as we all know, can be a difficult emotional subject and um, people don't like to, uh, to discuss it. Well, my parents are the silent generation, so that says it all, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, being a Gen X, we, you know, we've never had that, that conversation really. So, um, and I think I'd welcome it because I think people need to know um, exactly how to manage it and how to 
deal with things like care home fees and mm. you know because it's likely that the children would be managing that on behalf of their parents if they need if they've got to that stage in their life well I'd, I'd suggest Pippa that uh, perhaps you know starting a conversation about death is is the more difficult option of the two and yeah. and actually the conversation that you want to start is a conversation about transition of wealth and um, and things like care home fees and you know lifetime planning and where um, uh, what the needs are and what the potential yeah. scenarios are and just just to know what different uh, kind of scenarios exist and and where things are um, it's a really good point Dave because I think I think Jess you know you've probably seen the, the increase in interbeavers trusts coming in through our client base yeah. that are trying to put in trusts it's definitely yeah. becoming a lot more popular um, a lot more lifetime trust being drafted month on month, year on year. Yeah. Um, so I think that's definitely forefront at the moment. Yeah, and, and, and people are always talking about gifting and gifting plans and yeah. all of that kind of stuff as well now. So I think, yeah. like you say, it's not just about death, it's about managing that family wealth situation. Mm. Yeah, and it, look, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the other end of the continuum, and I'm sure there's plenty of practitioners who are listening in today going, yeah, but Dave, you know, um, actually I get a lot of millennials um, asking me for a copy of the will and the testator is going um, over my dead body yeah. literally you know <laughs> you are not going to see a copy of it because yeah. uh, and there's all sorts of examples of some some behaviors which say hey you know I really can't wait I, I, I really need that money now yeah. um, and and you know uh, economic hardship and all sorts of kind of drivers behind that and some of that is just generational behavioral kind of um, attitudes towards money yeah. and uh, and so there's a, there's a balancing act in there but the 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 question in my mind is uh, can you afford not to facilitate that conversation you can't not do it and uh, I would uh, I would imagine that most consumers would be very open to the idea of just having a conversation about maybe even part of the uh, the family wealth transition it doesn't have to be about hey you know she's going to get that necklace and you're going to get that you know it, it's it, it can be more about a wider range of different activities yeah absolutely well let's let's move on let's talk about the different generations and how they like to buy because i think that's a really good context mm. in, in which to talk about some of the other you know outcomes of the survey and what what we're talking about today so you can see here on the slide the different characteristics between the different generations so you know aspiration wise baby boomers are all about job security us gen x is then dave work-life balance would you see that that is that's key consideration want the time back Pippa. want yeah, the time, want the time back, back. <laughs> yeah and, and jess you know aspiration there is all about freedom and flexibility yeah absolutely i'll get the work done in my time let me be flexible and free to do things that I need to do when I want to do them. <laughs> Absolutely. And can I just jump in there and say, actually what Jess is talking about there is the freedom to lie in bed and make all of her life admin decisions. <laughs> yes. right? That is a very important part about being a I won't ask you how you know she lies in bed. <laughs> well, she's told me, Papa, I just want to be very clear that that is not first-hand knowledge. All right? <laughs> so is this true, Jess? Do you sit in, in your bed on your mobile phone doing yep. all of your life admin? Absolutely. Yeah, Dave and I, you know, in preparation for the webinar, now we were discussing different buying habits and I say the amount of money I can spend just lying in bed on my phone you know yeah. just ads pop mm. up and I'll go oh yeah that's a nice coat or whatever you know <laughs> and there I've, I've bought it and I've managed to spend a whole bunch of money before I even my feet touch the floor in the morning so <laughs> Um, yeah. So you need you need the inheritance now to pay <laughs> yeah. all the things that you're buying in bed. Um, attitude towards technology it obviously goes without saying that you guys are digital natives you've grown up with it yeah can you definitely. remember a time without not having a phone yeah i actually can because yeah. i think i'm at the the kind of end side of the millennials yeah. <laughs> but um you know i i remember the start of social media and even though i remember the start of it i still can't imagine life without it, it. Yeah. you know so it's more of my life that i've had it than i haven't had it yeah. same with having a phone so yeah uh, absolutely we talk about attitude towards careers, so um, Gen X is very much early portfolio careers, loyal to the profession, not necessarily to the employer. And you guys, as millennials, Jess, you're the digital entrepreneurs, you work with organisations, not for an organisation, you get involved and are passionate about it. Text or social media, would you say, is the way you communicate with your friends, Jess? Oh yeah, 100%. Yeah. Dave, email and text? Or I just call, you know. Yeah. 
Maybe. Oh no, that's going into the baby boomers. Yeah. It's, you're well, showing that you're on the edge. You're on the cusp. I was reminded just before we started recording that I have a dinosaur phone. So, um, it has a button on it. I it guess. has a button, and it's an iPhone. And so, yeah, look, I mean, my preference is probably text, WhatsApp. Um, I yeah. would do that. But yeah, I mean, sometimes a phone call is just the easiest thing to do, isn't it? And, and we've touched in it on we've touched on it already, but in terms of the way that you like to buy, Jess will buy in bed at ten o'clock at night, seven o'clock in the morning. Would you predominantly go face to face? You will go online, but not necessarily sit in bed and do it. Oh, no, uh, I kind of I kind of do my research um, that way, and then I'll consider it and then I might speak to a few people <laughs> and then I'll make a decision uh you know maybe it's not a, that a, immediate gratification like yeah. it is with millennials no no <laughs> although to be fair the ticket items that I'm looking at generally have a big price tag so I should be a bit more circumspect than uh you can't buy it any more cars day mm. <laughs> right so um, we've we've talked about their buying behaviours and 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 which ways they would do it and which ways people want to buy as, as actually you're moving from the baby boomers through to the Gen Xs and then through to the millennials. But what is it they want? Um, and a lot of people are actually digitising their practice at the moment and preparing themselves for the client for the future. So you can see here, you know, people are investing in digitising more of their processes. So their turnaround for clients is, is quicker. They're working on becoming more accessible, using different tools like the social media, websites, etc. Introducing digital tools to get the digital data capture. So what can you say that we've done to prepare our business for millennials? Because, you know, there's a lot of millennials purchasing our services. So what do you think as a business we've done? Yeah, um, I think internally, uh, we're, we're a very purpose-led organisation. That's a very kind of hackneyed phrase these days, but um, my personal belief as a CEO is that uh, people need to believe in what they're doing, and, and millennials are very big on that. Um, the, uh, the research tells us that millennials will buy based on uh, environmental and, um, and societal uh, factors. So you know, what, is a, what does an organisation look like? In those two areas, and uh, we we like to think of ourselves as um, as being really strong in in both of those two two yeah. areas. So for law firms, that's that's the same. Yeah. That. So uh, going to you, Jess, obviously because you're dealing with the client and the client base all the time. How have you seen? I mean, support is one of the things that you know that you you look after. Um, you know, have you seen a lot of transition from people? You know, picking up the phone looking for support to mm to email, to online chat, to use of the chat bots, videos, self-help, all that kind of stuff? It's definitely a mix, I think, but um, the online chat has definitely proved very, very popular. I think it's because it's really quick, um, but people prefer, or the generation prefers <laughs> not to pick up the phone. I know myself, I don't, I'd much rather send a message, send an email, than pick up the phone. Um, you know that's because I'm lying in bed. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I think definitely from a support perspective, how, what we've seen internally is the increase of the online chat, that instant response, that not having to pick up the phone. So a little bit different to email and, and phone. Just before we carry on, um, just share a couple of other results from the survey that we've got. So. If we look at these, this is the question around why aren't you preparing the business for the next generation of buying behaviours? And I'm sure a lot of us can resonate with that. So what are the blockers for preparing for the great wealth transfer for that next generation for their buying behaviours? Um, and we can see here that 39% said they've not got enough time. And I think that's something that we can all empathise with. We just don't have enough time to be looking ahead and seeing what's coming over the hill. But it's really important that we do that. 26% said not enough budget. Again, I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with that. So one in four people have not got enough budget to invest in this kind of stuff in the preparation for the next generations. And 36% said it's not on the board's or partner's radar, which again, one in three, you know, the, the, the boards, how can we influence, how can we take this message to the boards or to the partners 
so that they can have an idea of what they need to be preparing for um, to put the time to put the budget in. So um, not much surprise in the answers there, but again, something that really needs to be thought through um, completely. If we move on to the next question then that follows on from that. So in an ideal world, which would you invest in? Would you invest in becoming more accessible for new clients via digital channels? Would you invest in um, clients having a portal that helps them manage all the actions and where they can review the status of their estate plan, etc. Or number three, there we've got there, which is investing in digitizing all the processes so that the turnaround is quicker for the clients. Now, it, it's quite interesting, isn't it, that 42%, that that's not far off half of the people are saying that they are working on uh, becoming more accessible for new clients via those digital channels, whether that's the social media, whether it's their website. So there's a real focus on that. And then the, num the number two and the number three, there's sort of like one in three of you are saying that they would like clients to have a portal that they can um, manage actions, they can review the status of their estate plan. And um, I would like to say that we do one, but I won't I won't put too much of a sales pitch in there. So please do talk to us if you're interested in that. But and then number three, digitizing those processes. So turnaround is quicker. Again, you know, the use of technology there is really, really important. So I just thought it was worth sharing those extra results with you before we carry on. Um, just to show you um, that you'll probably will give you reassurance that you're not the only people that um, are suffering from finding that time, from finding the budget, from influencing upwards, um, and then being able to invest in those digital processes and technology to help. Uh, right, let's carry on now. Okay, so we, we've talked about a huge amount of things today. We've talked about the millennials being the richest generation, the great wealth transfer, why everybody needs to be thinking about the millennials and how to engage them now so they've got their business for the future, but also the position millennials are in at the moment. So Dave, I know you've had a thought about, because we threw this question to you, you know, what are your five top tips for, for everybody today to actually reach millennials? Well, I think that every law firm will have uh, millennials uh, in their practice, whether they're connecting with them and engaging with them or not, because yeah. the will data, and we know this because obviously we hold the will data for you, has uh, the beneficiaries. So you, you know who these people are, and often you are already talking to those people about LPAs, and if you're not, maybe you know, that's an opportunity for you to, to do so. Uh, you can also participate with those people in terms of educating them. Uh, helping them to understand, in fact, uh, what estate planning is, why it's important, and, and how that can help them to help their parents. Um, there's all sorts of things that I've seen different law firms are doing, which I think are really useful to connect with the millennials within the practice. So that's kind of the, the, the number one thing. But I'm really interested in, in, rather than me kind of saying what millennials want, to hear from the millennial herself yeah. um, <laughs> yep. a, about kind of what other ideas there might be. I think, you know, being a millennial buy-in, something it needs to be pretty convenient um, there needs to be quite a lot of information around it I don't know if there's enough information about why you need a will um, you know why for me do I need a will you know I don't know the importance of it I mean I do because I'm in the industry but generally I, I don't think it's well known enough I think you feel you only need a will when you have a lot of money a lot of assets but that's certainly not the case so I think that education piece is also really good um, but and, and it's earning the trust of them too because we have so much information at our fingertips we can you know compare so easily and we're so quick on our on our devices to do that so it's it's thinking like a millennial when you get putting yourself out there and marketing uh, yeah and absolutely and, and if you've got millennials in your staff ask them yeah, how they would like absolutely. to buy and how, what what information would attract them or their mm. friends or colleagues etc so you know there's a lot of I mean we distill this down to five but but basically have that digital capability because you want to sit and fill out a form. When you've made a decision, suddenly you've been uh, persuaded that you need to do a will. Yeah. You know, your parents might have told you mm. or you might have been looking at something online on social media and it mm -hmm. pops up and you've had a thought, you've had an investigation while you're lying in bed at seven o'clock in the morning, although I know you're up at five o'clock to go <laughs> to the gym. But do you know what I mean? It, it's, do you want to do it? There's an immediacy around yeah. it, isn't it? So you want, you want, it, you want to do time. it digitally and do it now. Yeah, I want it now. So if I'm not yeah. going to be able to do it now, then I'm not going to do it. You know, yeah. because I'm, I'll forget about it. I'll be busy. So it's as I've thought about it, I want that now. So it's how someone can have access to that 
yeah, to engage you straight away exactly. while you're on their website, for example, or on their social post or whatever it is mm -hmm. that you're seeing. You need a methodology to, I just want to sort this now, can I do it? Yeah. So there's so an interesting point. Can I just jump in there? Yeah. Because sometimes sorting that doesn't mean concluding it. No. It no. means I've got a problem and I want to know that I've started a solution. Mm. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So you might be lying in bed thinking, okay, I've got to get a will. Right. Mm. Let's go and get this thing started. And I might fill in a form and I'm quite happy filling in a form yes, online. Yeah. And uh, now I know that somebody's going to call me or the whole process is going to kick Start. off. So, so for the practitioners, they don't have to think about delivering a service because no. you know the the way that the practices work is that they prefer to work face to face and and i get that you know that that makes a lot of sense a lot of value in in doing things that way so um don't don't get tricked into thinking that that you have to deliver a whole solution online and that you're never going to speak to the client yeah, because absolutely. that's not the case no. uh, you you just need to find a way to appear to the uh, millennial generation that uh, you are digital, that's easy, that you're available all the time, yeah. that they can uh, circumvent what can be a, a slower, longer process. Yeah. So, I mean, that comes up to the second point that we've got here is about being convenient and online. Yeah. So you want that information mm. to be online. You want to have virtually made your decision yeah. of who you're going to go to before you've even spoken to them. You're, you're making that decision online, yeah? Absolutely. So it's really important that people hang out where you're hanging out. Yeah, and if you think of marketing to millennials, you know, where where are they looking most of the time? On their phone, Social media. on TikTok, <laughs> you know, and as uncomfortable it may be is people buy from people, and I think especially millennials mm. do that. You know, that's why you have so many influencers now. People yeah. buy from people. So yeah. who in your team is going to be the face of your wills? <laughs> yeah. Putting mm. themselves out there on social media to, to get those millennials in. Brilliant. And then picking up on a point I think you made, uh, one of you made earlier, was all about this education piece. So how can you educate people and support them? Because they might not necessarily know, know you know now, yeah. you're in the industry, why it's important to have a will. But, you know, the vast majority of millennials don't. Mm. They think it's something you do when you get older, which is probably why the demographic mm. lends itself the way it has. So basically sharing content, that is not just about we're a law firm, we, you know, we will will writer come and talk to us. Yeah. But the reasons why. why, giving advice, giving education, a lot of information online, that would really attract you. That would really. Oh, help. absolutely. I, you know, you need to know why it's so important. Otherwise, why do I need to spend my money here? Mm. Yeah. You know, it doesn't feel relevant to me because I feel like I don't have enough to to warrant that expense. So. And, and how would you feel, Dave? I mean, one of the points we've got here is talk to your current clients. So, you know, if you were a client of a law firm, will writer, legal advice firm, whatever, and they said, right, well, you know, obviously you're going to be passing your money on. Dave, it's really important the rest of your family have this wealth conversation, have an estate plan in place. It's going through the generations. Are you happy that we get your children involved or your beneficiaries involved in, it, in how we're going to manage all of this? Um, from an estate planning perspective, you know whether that's gifting, whether it's trusts, mm -hmm. whether it's just putting in the kind of things that they need. Um, you think that's an important point as well? Yeah, I do. I think it's a change, isn't it? You know, society's changing, and uh, that's one of the changes that that may well come about because we're we're facing this massive transformational shift which is just unique in humankind this has never happened before no. and so expecting that we do things the same way as the way that we've done them in the past you know when you go to the movies and they read the will and go oh my god i'm <laughs> getting a you know a yacht <laughs> you know, yeah. um you know that that sort of stuff um belongs in the movies because actually today i think that because society is changing because circumstances are changing because you've got this massive divide between um, the rich and the poor because you've got needs in between like the lifetime gifting bit around you know education of grandkids and helping millennials into homes and all these other sorts of things that's a conversation that that should and and does take place but is it the standard kind of approach well probably not yet and, and yet that's what needs to to start happening so for uh, law firms and and practitioners that to me sells opportunity that, that means that they've got this great opportunity to 
uh, to start to do that. And what do they do when they do that? Well, they start to extend their practices. They start to find other opportunities. They start to future-proof themselves by connecting with a whole bunch of different people. Can I just add quickly too, for all the partners in the room, uh, you might be thinking about why on earth you'd manage uh, or bother about uh, you know doing all of this when you might be thinking about selling a practice or, or whatever. Uh, the, the, the point I'd make to you is that that is exactly why you should think about doing this because the uh, connection with the beneficiaries, the management of the data that you have within your practice, the, um, uh, the value of your book, of your will bank, uh, is increasingly going to become uh, measured with, especially with the um, uh, prevalence now of data analysis tools by the mixture of the demographic spread that you have within your client base. So if you're a small high street solicitor and you've only got kind of, you know, an average age of say 75 and the average age of uh, baby boomer um, life expectancy is 77, am I going to value your practice the same as what I'm valuing a practice which has a mixture of millennials who I know that I can put that into my practice and I've got another 20 to 30 years of lifetime earnings from those people. That's a really, really good point, Dave. Thank you for making that. The, the final tip here really um, is meet them where they're at. Mm. Um, and I think millennials are at a slightly different stage mm. um, and there's different life triggers there, but there are opportunities, especially within a law firm, to get to them. So something, you know, just if you bought a house, for example, yeah. Yeah, did your conveyancing department of your the law firm you use, did they suggest you do a will? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> and and you know, I hear that quite a lot when, yeah. when I'm talking to clients as well. There's lots of opportunity within a practice, isn't there, to cross-sell. Oh, there's yeah. life events that are happening other play other in other departments of the law firm. Mm -hmm. And actually managing those leads too, Dave, it's not an easy process. It's something that could be digitized, but mm. Do you think yeah, and look, I think the bigger the practice, the less that happens, and um, the more silo they become, and and you know therefore the bigger the opportunity. And and, and digital technology um, and Arkin has this uh, capability it means that you can do it, and uh, and you, you're probably missing opportunities if you're not doing that because yeah. at the end of the day, it's just data, right? Mm -hmm. It's just data um, transitioning itself around a practice uh, on a really efficient basis. Uh, absolutely. So. Um... To summarise that element of it then, you know, I think you've demonstrated quite well, thank you for your different generations there, um, on the reasons why that, that firms need to transition their, their average age, if you like, and, and work with us if they, if they use us in, in, in terms of how you can actually do that. Just to give you a quick summary for those of you who don't know Arkan, uh, we are, have been around for over 30 years now. Um, and we really are driving the digitization of the private client sector from will writing software to IB trust drafting software, tax reporting, online wills, digital data capture, lead generation tools. Um, we integrate and, and partner with other people. We've got an ARC and Vault for digital assets. And, and recently we've, we've launched the Instruction Hub. Um, and that can be anything from a, a link that you send to clients to get them to fill in a digital form beforehand all the way down to a, a, a full on client portal that not only allows you to do quoting, but also digitize the entire process, which is something I think I imagine as a millennial, you wouldn't mind it being all digitized. Oh, absolutely. You know, and being able to log in at any time of day, you know, it's all about convenience, isn't it yes. really? And flexibility. We all know your system. <laughs> <laughs> so we all yes, everyone knows you doing you everything at 7 o'clock in the morning. Yes. But, you know, please do talk to us if you're looking to digitise your practice, if you're looking to try and target younger generations. Um, obviously, we've got that information for our clients, but um, as you use the system, we'll be able to help you more and more with that. Uh, I'm just going to throw it out to questions to see if we've got any questions out there. Um, can I get a copy of the survey results as one's come in? Yeah, there's quite a lot in the survey uh, results, so we'll send them out as part of the, the follow up from this. Um, how many people completed the survey? I'm looking for, for somebody to tell me. 252. Right, so I'm being told there was 252 um, practices, legal practices that filled the survey, so thank you. Um, vast majority were legal firms, though, I think, weren't they? Um, and one last question um, to both of you, really, is why do you think millennials aren't trusted to manage their inheritance? Oh, I'll go first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that's because there is a mismatch of 
uh, kind of what's important to the millennial generation to what's important to the baby boomer generation and Gen X generation. It is an absolute generational divide. So you've got different expectations. Baby boomers are all about sort of wealth accumulation and um, and they obviously grew up post-war when things were tough. The whole experience is different. And uh, oftentimes they are very tight and very controlled around their spending. Millennials have grown up in a time where um, there has been plenty. There has been low interest rates. There's been uh, uh, anything they want, they would generally get. And so therefore their expectation and attitude to money is very, very different. Mm -hmm. Am I wrong? No, I think you're very right. And I think you know, if you think of social media and online buying, there's that instant gratification. Mm -hmm. So it's easy spending. Um, you know, you have a lot of credits available. Um, I had another thought and now it's gone out of You're my... You're going to talk about Amazon and your job. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was saying to Dave, I'll wake up, you know, and, and my husband has bought a load of things on, on Amazon just mm -hmm. while he's awake at 11 o'clock at night and I'm I'm asleep. asleep. So I think it's, it's also, oh, that's what I was going to say is, you know, a lot of the millennials haven't actually dealt with cash. All money yes. has been digital. Mm. And I feel like there's a real concept of, of actual money. So yes. I think it's it's just easy to spend. It's, it's a really important point, actually, because I grew up, my pocket money was in my hands. Yeah. Mm. And I physically had to go and spend it mm. and hand it over. There was no card. Yeah. Yeah. So it actually meant something. Yeah. And you actually saw it go away, mm. Mm. Um, exactly. which is important. And um uh, you know, my mother always used to say to me, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. And I think that is very much from that generation. Whereas I don't think you look after the pennies, do you? You just spend the pounds. No, exactly. just, the yeah. just the pounds. <laughs> can, can I just say too, Pippa, that, that there is kind of a, uh, a, an impact there because, you know, when you've got this wealthiest generation of all time, it's very visible. You know, you would know that dad has a, has a yeah. portion of, and a car collection and a house in Spain or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, you know that they're going to pass on and you also know that there's a fair chance that you're going to get that money. You have yeah. the security. Right? So, so the baby boomers didn't ever have that, yeah. right? Like, I, I won't get much from my from my dad, I don't yeah. think, you know, um, because I, I have never had an expectation no. at all. And in fact, he was over to see me recently and I said, don't spend it. Yeah. Spend it. Don't, like, leave it for yeah. us, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, but it's just different for the millennials because you, you grow up and you know, this, the, it, it, I'm not going to use the word entitlement, but that yeah. you have an expectation. A plan, basically. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, a backup plan for your retirement. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I think it's been a fascinating conversation to get today. So thank you very much, um, both Jess and Dave, uh, for being on camera. Um, <laughs> I, I, I peek behind the camera today. Uh, but thank you very much for being on camera and really adding to the survey results we've got from our recent survey. And there's lots more in that survey uh, results that we'll send you through, but it's probably all we've got time for today. So thank you very much. I uh, hope you enjoyed listening. If we haven't got to your question, then we will in, um, answer them individually. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And please let us know if we can help. Just contact us. All right. Many thanks then. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.